Then do that. And good evening. Welcome to another coffee with non Kruger. No, non coffee with Kruger. <laughs> Kruger's here, and a bunch of you are here. And welcome as we look this evening at the typology of the uh, Old Testament high priest's apparel and paraphernalia to mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, as mentioned in the book of Hebrews, as the final high priest, the permanent high priest. So we should have some uh, good learning ahead of us uh, this evening. It's going to accompany, uh, be accompanied by a, a short YouTube video where we okay. see how they put together all the things that the high priest wore. And then also some uh, other diagrams that will helpfully, hopefully make some sense of, of some things which are not too clear. So let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, uh, we recognize that you sent your son to be to the threefold office of prophet, priest, and king. And and uh, in his prophetic role, uh, he's, he, he forecast the fact that he was going to fulfill all the prophecies of the Old Testament. He was going to suffer and die for the sins of the world, which he did. Uh, in his kingly role, he rose from the dead. And not only is the king over the kingdom of power that all people, whether they appreciate it or not, are part of, but the kingdom of grace, which we Christians here on earth are part of, and the kingdom of glory in heaven. And he's also our high priest. And that's why we say that he rose again and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. The sitting on the right hand is the priestly role. He is the one in whose name we pray. Uh, he's the one who makes every blessing happen and gives us the right to call God Father. Lord, thank you for that. Be with us in our study now. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus. Amen. 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 So when we look at when we look at the high priestly role uh, of uh, in the Old Testament, we right away think about how God instructed Aaron and his sons to be the high priests on behalf of God for the people. They would be the go-between. And a, a, a tent, a tabernacle was erected uh, by by uh, by prescription in the Old Testament. Uh, Moses had that done, and later on, under King Solomon, there was the uh, priestly. There was the, the the tent, the temple, and so you had the Old Testament temple, and then later on, we had a temple that was called Herod's temple at the time of Jesus. The yeah. differentiation between Solomon's temple and the tabernacle before it and Herod's temple is that the priests no longer had the Holy Spirit at the time of Jesus, at the time of the Herod's temple. And so some of what was being used by the priests had no effect because God was not in the Holy of Holies anymore. The Ark of the Covenant was missing ever since the Babylonian captivity in 586 B.C. It's gone. Huh. So all they had was a shell. All they were doing was rites, rituals, and red tape. Uh, they weren't worshiping like they had been at the time of King Solomon. Before that, the time when God was leading them uh, through the uh, pillar of fire and pillar of cloud and uh, spoke to them directly uh, at the time of the tabernacle. So with that, then, let's uh, take a look at a video of what the high priest would wear and see how that corresponds uh, after the video with Jesus. And when we do this, uh, it'll, you'll be looking at this for about seven minutes or so for the video. So there we go. You see the video? And take thou unto thee Aaron thy it? brother and yes. his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. And these are the garments which they shall make. 
a breastplate and an ephod and a robe and a broidered coat, a mitre and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, and of purple, of scarlet and fine twined linen with cunning work. It shall have the two shoulder pieces thereof joined at the two edges thereof, and so it shall be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod which is upon it shall be of the same, according to the work thereof, even of gold, of blue and purple, and scarlet and fine twined linen. And thou shalt take two onyx stones, and grave on them the names of the children of Israel, six of their names on one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, shalt thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. Thou shalt make them to be set in ouches of gold. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for stones of memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. And thou shalt make ouches of gold and two chains of pure gold at the ends. Of wreathen work shalt thou make them, and fasten the wreathen chains to the ouches. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod thou shalt make it, of gold, of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine twined linen shalt thou make it. Four square it shall be, being doubled. A span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. And thou shalt set in it settings of stones, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, and a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. And the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row a ligure, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row a beryl, and an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet. Every one with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains at the ends of wreathen work of pure gold. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate two rings of gold, and shalt put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And thou shalt put the two wreathen chains of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate. And the other two ends of the two wreathen chains thou shalt fasten in the two ouches, and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod before it. And thou shalt make two rings of gold, and thou shalt put them upon the two ends of the breastplate in the border thereof, which is in the side of the ephod inward, and two other rings of gold thou shalt make, and shalt put them on the two sides of the ephod underneath, toward the forepart thereof, over against the other coupling thereof, above the curious girdle of the ephod. And they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof, unto the rings of the ephod, with a lace of blue, that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod, and that the breastplate be not loosed from the ephod. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. And thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue. And there shall be an hole in the top of it in the midst thereof. It shall have a binding of woven work round about the hole of it, as it were the hole of an habergeon, that it be not rent. And beneath upon the hem of it thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet round about the hem thereof, and bells of gold between them round about. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe round about. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out, that he die not. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, 
and grave upon it like the engravings of a signet, Holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace, that it may be upon the mitre, upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts. And it shall be always upon his forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord. And thou shalt embroider the coat of fine linen, and thou shalt make the mitre of fine linen, and thou shalt make the girdle of needlework. And for Aaron's sons thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make for them girdles, and bonnets shalt thou make for them, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shalt anoint them, and consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness, from the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come in unto the tabernacle of the congregation, or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place, that they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto him and his seed after him. All right, all right. So this gives us an opportunity to get a, a little bird's eye view of what was the some of the apparel for the high priest at the time of the of Moses in the Old Testament. So just to recap, um, the underlayer would be a pure white linen. So pure white linen undergarments that would really go from the neck all the way down to the feet, covering them com the high priest completely in white. And we know from scripture that white symbolizes purity, right? Moral perfection. And so this is uh, really the high priest himself was a person standing who was not morally perfect. And that's why he had to offer sins for himself uh, as he went to the temple. But he was picturing and would foreshadow a high priest who would come who would be perfectly righteous. So a base layer of pure white symbolizes the righteousness and the purity of our great high priest, Jesus Christ. Then above the undergarments, you had that robe uh, and an uh, Exodus uh, 28. Uh, it, it says makes a robe of the, ephod entirely a blue cloth opening for the head and uh so you put it over you and then at the bottom there would be pomegranates a blue purple and scarlet yarn and then you'd have gold bells in between them so if they go in and out the lord would know who's coming and not nuke the high priest and so uh you have that pure white now we get something a little bit more ornate with the blue and the and the uh, different colors, someone who's uh, as a co colors of royalty, someone who's going to be a high priest who's also going to be a king. But not only do we have these beautiful colors and designs along the edge of the robe, but you also have uh, the, the it's made of gold, the the bells, and so it's very expensive, very beautiful, and it's meant to draw one's attention to something else, something uh, very unique. Uh, and that's the honor, of course, of ultimately of Jesus Christ, the glorious one. So, <clears throat> okay, we get above the robe, we have the ephod, which was made of the same color, blue, purple, scarlet yarn, interwoven with gold thread. <clears throat> so the same themes are there that we had before, but now you also have at the top of the ephod and the shoulders, the two onyx stones that are uh, mentioned also in Exodus 28. And upon the two onyx stones would be engraved on them the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. So the weight, the shoulder, the weight on one's shoulders of the high priest would be for the sins 
of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so the high priest Jesus has on his shoulders the weight of the whole world on his shoulders. But if for the Old Testament priest, it was the weight of, of Israel that would be there. And, uh, and then, of course, you had in the front, you would have the, the various stones, 12 of them, each with the name of one of the tribes of Israel. And that's also in Exodus 28. And so it becomes the breast piece that's closest to the heart. And so in the book of Revelation, when it says that they will give us a new st a white stone that no one knows the name of, that'll be closest. And, and that white stone would symbolize what the what was on the breastplate with the diamond or the emerald that was close to the heart because we are the new Israel. In fact, we are the new children of Abraham. We are the promised ones. And again, we are the ones that the high priest, uh, that we, we go to the Lord through the high priest. Then you come to the turban. And again, you have the pure white. And on it is a gold plate on the outside of the turban that has a very specific reference in uh, Exodus 28, as a matter of fact, uh, verses 36 through eight, make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it as on a seal, holy to the Lord. Fasten a blue cord to attach it to the turban. And that was on Aaron's forehead. It would bear the guilt involved in the sacred gifts that the Israelites would consecrate. So the high priest is taking the sins of the nation before the Lord, offering sacrifice for himself and them. And then the Lord uh, covers over the sin for that particular time. When Jesus becomes into the, uh, to earth, it's as though it were the day of atonement. The high priest wore all of these ornamental artifacts and clothing every time they went in to offer sacrifice, every time they went into the uh, holy place, except one day a year, the day of atonement. In the day of atonement, the high priest would take off all of those things and all he would wear would be the, the white robe. Mm -hmm. And so it points us uh, again to Jesus, who reminds us that, uh, that he comes not with the, the signs of a king, but the signs of a servant to die for the sins of the world. Now, that the turban that's on the head of the high priest in the Old Testament had on it a... Um, it was made of gold. It's interesting to note that after the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, uh, there came a curse. And if you've read through that, you know that the curse was to the serpent. It was to Adam and Eve. But then it was also to the whole world. And, and the whole world was cursed. And that uh, would not be easy to grow things. Instead of things coming up like they should, instead thorns and thistles would come up as a result of the ground being cursed. And it specifically mentions that one of the signs of the curse would be these thorns. So when the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, comes on his day of atonement to die on the cross for the sins of the world, not wearing the ornamentation of the high priest, but just a very little at all that he was wearing, he also had a crown. And it was the crown of those thorns that were cursed in Genesis 3. And that he would die not only for the sins of the world, but he would die in order to make a non-cursed world, a new heaven and a new earth. And it was symbolic of all of that. So we get uh, that particular theme as a beautiful theme, topology, in Jesus Christ, that from the very beginning, when he, God is giving the garments to the high priest, he knows exactly who Jesus is and what he's going to accomplish. And so that's the outfit that he points to 
uh, and then a, a, also the colors, the blue, the purple, the scarlet, the gold, colors that are very important because they denote and are the same colors that are used uh, in the formation of the tabernacle and the curtains of the tabernacle as a place where God meets his people, a God who is a high priest. It takes the blood because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So you get the red and the blue, the purple, the, the scarlet. Uh, but you also have Jesus, who is Emmanuel, who is with us, who is the high priest. And so we have the color white. One other thing that uh, we should mention is that as the ephod was put together, the high priest would take two stones. We think it's two stones called the Urim and the Thummim. U-R-I-M and T-H-U-I-M-I-M. -I -I and we don't know much about them. These are mysterious, mysterious uh, stones. Uh, the actual Hebrew word uh, for Urim translated into English is lights. The actual Hebrew word for Thummim translated into English is truth. So the breastplate worn by the high priest attached to the ephod and in there was a little pocket in the bottom and they could put those two stones in to determine what God's answer was to certain curses. Curses. And um, it, may be, it may be thought that uh, also that because the translation could be light and truth, that it can also typify Jesus Christ, who often is called the light and the truth. But usually what it was done was that, uh, for instance, uh, King Saul was trying to figure out who was uh, not doing something right with, within the armies of Saul. And so he used the uh, Urim and Thummim to see, was it this side or this side? Was it this clan or this clan? Was it this group, this group? And he finally comes to a, a, an answer, innocent or guilty. So all of that then is part of uh, what the high priest would wear. So I'm opening it up right now for some comments and questions as we look this evening at uh, the wardrobe of the high priest. I have a question. When did, um, when did this get designated? I know it's in, Exodus, when this all started, um, were they still in the wilderness or was this after they'd reached the promised land when it started with this costume? In the, in the wilderness with Moses? It was still in the wilderness and they were still... Exodus 28. So it was still the original people that had left Egypt, not the descendants yet? This was uh, when after... Uh, God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses to give to the mm -hmm. people. He gave them also the uh, ceremonial law. And in the ceremonial law uh, would be the description of how to build the tabernacle and how to build and what the high priest, the formation of the high priest and what he used to wear. And also when you mentioned the breastplate, I was thinking of the breastplate of righteousness that St. Paul refers to. Um, when he's talking about putting on the full armor of God. I thought that was kind of neat, too. It does all come together. But I would uh -huh. suggest that if you want to know more about Jesus as high priest, read the book of Hebrews. Because a lot okay. of the what's mentioned in the Old Testament is, is referenced in the book of Hebrews. Another question I had is, what are the ouches? <laughs> he kept using that yeah. word, ouches. ouches. <laughs> now, these are the fasteners. So they're called ouch because you might prick yourself on it. And we don't call them that. <laughs> you know, but, I just think what a shame it is that we have lost the beauty and the detail and the reverence of all that, that you know, to, to our God. I mean, listening to this tonight is just, you know, it opens up a, a whole new appreciation for the the what God did to show his people how much he loved them and how they could come to him 
and worship him. Uh, in, I appreciate what you're saying, Karen. You'd, you'd make a great Greek Orthodox. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't say that we have to do it in church every Sunday, but I'm saying to be aware of what this is. I mean, you just kind of skip over that. Oh, well, okay, there's a lot of detail. Symbolism. But when you actually see it, then it makes a difference. Symbolism is a tricky thing. Roman Catholicism is filled with symbolisms. Uh, even the idea that you you put your finger into some water when you walk into the church and make the sign of the cross. You ask people what they're doing. They have no clue. Yeah, Symbolism <laughs> works as long as it points to God. When it becomes exactly. becomes an end to itself or superstitious, which was well. the case, then maybe it served its day. But what what we see in church is that even if the old symbolisms aren't there, there may be new ones that are forming that people in this generation are using to a point uh, to their savior and what it means. What I like, and maybe I'm talking like you, Karen, is that there's such rich uh, symbolic value in the topology in the Old Testament pointing to Christ that uh, get people back in the word, get people back to understand that. And when they read it, they'll see it and treasure it like you're mentioning it. Yeah, I don't say we need to do those things. I just think that it would be good, you know, to let people know so we could understand because there's so much depth to being able to worship God. I mean, people do in different ways, but it brings out a, I don't know, it just brings out that love and treasure of who he is and how great he is. <laughs> it's just like a couple of weeks ago and I said, you know how they said your sins were a scarlet and they'll be white as snow? It all started mm -hmm. with a bug. Yeah. And what? Bug. <laughs> what yeah, place? they're Coco? a bug that where they got the scarlet to die from, and we showed the bug. Yeah, worm. worm, worm bug. Yeah. Also, I think about how heavy <laughs> that worm. Must have. Yeah. Who'd ever guess? <laughs> how heavy that must have been to wear. Yeah. Because you know all of that. Yeah. Is going to be some weight. You know, I was watching a. Uh, a history thing of people going to Yosemite National Park and they would wear their suits and their uh, uh, a head uh, oh. a cap and it was, uh, you know, 80, 90 degrees out. Yeah. Even here in Fresno, they were doing that at the parks. Yeah. Who would be doing this? Who would wear this? Uh, people in, uh, a generation or two ago. Mm -hmm. Well, in the 1920s, the 30s, they would wear uh, more formal attire. I did. <laughs> you did. Yeah. Uh, uh, George, George, I, George can speak to this. I had a, my mother had a very interesting uh, a situation once. She was able to sew one of these outfits for the high priest for my brother, who was in teacher's college in Seward. And oh. uh, she had it hanging in her attic for years when he you know finished his i'm not sure why he needed an outfit but anyway she was sewed the whole thing and it was very detailed and beautiful i guess i would mm -hmm. love to out dave dave uh, our dce and do a kids children thing coming out as dressed as the high priest <laughs> yeah. That'd be fun. wouldn't that be a good children's message yeah <laughs> i often wondered what she did with this or what my brother did with it he was about i want, it, I want it by next week <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It'd be it'd be really, you know. I'm. I hope they kept it for a while, or maybe my sister in law has it. I don't know. But, Any other uh, thoughts? Uh, oh yeah, a question. Yeah. Oh no, go ahead, Teresa. You haven't spoken yet. Uh, well, you had just you had mentioned this. The curse be anyone. Well, of uh, the the ground, the thistles and the weeds, and when you brought that together with the crown on his head i i mean i don't like weeds i don't like um <laughs> i i curse them too but um <clears throat> this it just bringing that together from the genesis and you know the cursed ground and the thistles and the weeds and then that's what we did to jesus when he you know, went to 
redeem us and uh, pay for our sins and everything is just really a new concept for me. And I really appreciated that. And the other thing was the Urim and the Thurim. I never heard the light and truth of what it meant, those two words. So that's, I now want to get a Hebrew Bible or something, <laughs> or a little in Hebrew or something. <laughs> Yeah, most people see it as light and dark. They say yes or no, guilty or innocent. Yeah. It was the kind of thing that it was reserved for kings and priests and special occasions that they would use that. We see, Wendy, you have a picture there of the, those 12. Yeah, this is, you can actually order this on Amazon. I don't know if this is right side up or not, but this is a pendant. Something it's to do a, after we're done it's here. On, only a few inches, but it's a memorial symbol for it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kevin had to look that up. Uh, I'm also wondering, does each each of the tribes have its own color? Kind of like, um, like a college has its colors or a high school has colors? Do they each have their own color? Well, because they had on the breastplate the 12 tribes of Israel each was engraved upon a um, on a gemstone. So okay. was is there a particular That's color? Right. It Beginning with the oldest top. to the youngest son. And the does each one have a particular children of color? Jacob were mentioned there, the twelve tribes of Israel, and each one had its own stone. Mm -hmm. well, I think we, what you say any significance to that? each having their own stone was it each one was a what each tribe had a different definition and each tribe had a different duty each tribe had a different station around the tabernacle where they were to camp and we can get into this in another session but there's symbolism even in that so, now yeah. you have to see the book of revelation says that that we are the, you know, it talks about the 12 tribes and it talks about the New Testament church. It talks about the 12 times 12 and makes makes out of that the 144,000. So that, which is the culmination of all the people of God who will be with the Lord. So we have so much imagery that's there and it's all taken, uh, much of it is taken from Zechariah um, the the Old Testament books of Exodus and and um, Leviticus. Yeah. Okay, Judy. I think you had a, your hand up. Yeah. The thing that I see is that you have to consider the Old Testament sort of goes to form, and then with Jesus it goes to content because Jesus was very down to earth and it was what he was what we are to learn how we are to believe not how we appear the form is good to get your attention but the content is the main thing so the form is the old testament and the substance was jesus yeah and you see in jesus the perfection of everything that was typified in the old testament yeah. By imagery. So very good, Judy. It's very good thought. Anyone else? Uh, miss anybody? Jeannie, you haven't said much. No, I'm listening to everybody, and I'm not really sure what I could add. Other than, did I understand your answer to Wendy, that all, all of this started when they were in the wilderness? Mm -hmm. That they were in the wilderness. And how did they have all of this richness with them to produce these where'd they get the gold where'd they get the linen fabric i mean yeah. i thought they were out Egypt. there like wafers <laughs> well start in exodus chapter 28 go back a couple chapters and uh you'll see that they had uh, been around the block for 40 years yeah, but I thought it was all out in the desert. How did they accumulate all of this when they're out in the desert? Well, they gathered some of those things. The Lord will provide. I think I could also speak to that. I, I believe that right before they left Egypt, 
they spoiled the Egyptians. I think there's a quote from there that that they were the Egyptians were so scared after they lost their firstborns. And they said, here, take my gold necklace, take yeah. my and yeah. take take all my jewelry. Just right. just go get out of here. Here's some money. <laughs> so they had a lot of this, like spoils of war with them. Oh, well, that's good. Thanks, Wendy. You're welcome. Well, I just wonder how many of those outfits they needed was only one. And then how do they keep that clean or keep it clean? One high, one high priest. And but he didn't have an extra set in case something their, happened. The sons would have their own white robes and it was a prescription of how they're to dress. But then the, the genealogy from Aaron to the sons all the way down to what should have been John the Baptist as the last Old Testament high priest, but he wasn't. Instead, you had Ananias and uh, Caiaphas, Annas and Caiaphas, and they bought their role as high priests, even though uh, they weren't legitimate from the tribe of Aaron, from the tribe of Levi. I said tribe of Levi, family of Aaron, and, and yet they took all that role. And that, that happened after the Babylonian captivities, the Romans and others would take on the uh, role of high priest because there's a lot of money in it. Yeah. All, the, all the clinking of sounds of the, the money coming in, they, they, you know, it's just like government. Yeah. It is, was their government. Okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, that's it for tonight, folks. I hope you enjoyed it. Learned something. I did. God I bless did. you. And we'll see you some of you on Sunday for Stump the Pastor. <laughs> and even if you don't come to our church, all you have to do is email me and ask me a question that I can understand. <laughs> and I'll try to answer it. If I can't answer it, well, you get a free cup of coffee on me. <laughs> All right. Uh, Peter, are, are you in Europe? Uh, I'm going to be on Sunday. I'm headed down the, over to SFO at 920, so I will be missing your stump, the pastor. I'll, e I'll, I'll email you my stump. Uh, okay. I'll text it to you because I will be on the Marin Airport or going to the airport. Um, well, I sure hope you're, you're regrafted with a new shoot of life from the stump. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. God bless you.